Um, well, good morning. It's day three. I don't know about um, for you, but it certainly feels like about day 33 um, for me, and I'm um, whilst very excited about the conference also um, not, not so much not looking forward to um, getting a little bit of a rest as well. Thank you very much for turning up so early this morning. We know there are early starts and long days, uh, particularly when you place meetings on either side as well. Um, but it is, you know, it is our place to come to network, to start to listen to each other's conversations. So it's wonderful to see so many people involved in that. Um, it's with a great deal of honour that I actually get to present um, our president. Today is a special day for him, I know. Um, it's a special day in a different uh, for different reasons for me, um, not least of which is I'm going to have to stop playing the whole role of Trump, which is, is, is good for me. Um, the Obama complex has been you know, running a little long, but anyway. Um, so I will um, introduce uh, Martin. Most of us know him. He's been involved in, in RRE for so many years and um, many of us have, have networks with him. He's currently the head of school um, and also a research professor in the School of Education at the University of Queensland and has indeed been at university for some time. His research interests we all know are around the sociology of education, um, around alternative schools, around social justice in education, um, gender in education, and he has international and national uh, networks and influence in, in all of those areas. Uh, his talk today is about education research, research that has an impact, be realistic, demand the impossible. And I think that really encapsulates uh, the kind of work that Martin's done as a president um, over the last two years. So he's been integrally involved um, with Val Klinowski, our research strategic um, officer on the executive, in actually um, engaging with policy, engaging with um, departments of education, state and commonwealth, and working with the ARC and other important policy um, spaces to actually bring some negotiations and to bring us into their visibility and has done some really, really important um, work there, laid some foundations for what will happen over the next few years. Um, and I think the other um, real sign of Martin's commitment to education in, um, in Australia is the very important work he's done in um, attempting to facilitate a space for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues to, to um, engage within the association and to increasingly find this as a safe place, we hope. We know we still have a lot of work to do in that area, um, but the work that Martin's been able to do with um, Tracy Bunder and many others and um, all of the members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander SIG um, has been really, really important. So I think you'll all agree that Martin um, has done some very, very important work for the association and really shifted us um, into the current context in ways that were, um, were required and will actually lay a foundation for us over the next um, few years. So thanks, Martin, and it's lovely to come in and, and follow you. So without um, taking up any more time, I'd like to introduce Martin um, for a presidential address that I know that he has been planning for many, many months. Each time we've come together and, and seen each other at different meetings, etc., it has been at the forefront of his mind for some time. So I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing um, or to hearing Martin today. So thanks, Martin. I'll thanks, Annette, for those very kind words. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we're meeting, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to elders past, present um, and emerging, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the audience. I would just say that some people would have known that Tracy had a fall yesterday and broke her arm and spent the night in hospital, but, for that, but she is recovering um, well and I'm informed safely ensconced in Mari and Lou's house and recovering nicely. So um, I just thought I would pass that on to people. I thought I'd also begin with my, um, I'll just check the time, <laughs> um, with my thank yous and acknowledgements, and it's always sort of difficult to get this right. The people throughout the talk that I will acknowledge, but I always seem to manage to forget something as some people in the, um, at this conference have found out. I do want to um, thank the RRE executives that I've worked with over um, my time as president. It's been a pleasure to um, work with them and I'll say something about that tonight at, as Margaret says at our very exciting AGM. Um, it would take too long now. I do want to acknowledge also the, the policy workers in the audience who are an integral member of our community and who have worked um, closely with Val and I during the course of the year. 
I also feel I need to thank and apologise to many colleagues that I've worked with on research projects and other work during the course of the year as they've been very patient with me whilst I've been undertaking the work of the Presidency. And Bob, I, I'm not sure if he's here, but I know I've been terrible with discourse work over the last little while. And I do want to thank those members who've trusted me with the Presidency or perhaps thought it was a joke to make an anarchist a President. Um, <laughs> I also want to um, thank Glenda. I know I've been away from home a lot during this presidency. From the moment I became president of AARE, I've been sort of living in terror of this moment. Um, I was so thrilled when I was made president, and then about 30 seconds later, I thought, oh my goodness, I have to give this address. Um, I spoke to Gemma Moss, president of um, Beera, about it, and she said that she too was terrified, and it's the first time she's ever written a speech. Um, so I jotted a few notes down too, which I'll probably most likely read. Um, so I do want to say, before I begin, what an honour it has been to be WRE President, to come to know the Australian research community in a way that I've not previously done. When I attended my first WRE conference in Brisbane in 1996 as a PhD candidate, and I'm grateful to Bob Lingard for multiple things, but encouraging me to become heavily in, involved in WARE is one of them. Um, I had no sense at that time of how important this association would become to me. And I know had um, I let Lynn Yates um, give her thank you um, to her life membership, she was going to say how important it had been to her too. So I think it's been central to my understandings of myself as an educational researcher in Australia. And I'll come back to the high regard in which I hold this association at the end. In trying to prepare for this presentation, I've been through many previous presidential addresses, the work of Bob and Trevor Gale in putting some of those addresses together has been really useful. I've read these and others, um, some that weren't included in that collection like Jill Blackmore's or Julianne Moss's um, in press publication and Bob's and Trevor's. And I noted that they, range, uh, that they cover a range of topics, some very grounded in their own research, some provide challenges for the association, and some help to map the field of educational research at the time. However, as Trevor and Bob indicated, what holds them together is they all seek to perform a pedagogical function. Many, too, are overly, overtly political. I hope that mine, too, can be pedagogical, political, and provoking and that there are not some people in the audience who think, you know, there's 45 minutes of my life I won't get back. Um, <laughs> or I could have stayed in bed for another hour. Um, so when I was putting this um, presentation together, um, and whilst I had been thinking about it ever since the moment I became president, it's only the, the sort of in recent times that I felt the real pressure. And I, um, in, I went to Dingle in Ireland after the ECER conference in Dublin in September, and I commented via email to Peter Renshaw about my stresses and about the wild Atlantic seas I could see out of my window. Um, he replied by suggesting I call the speech Rough Seas of Contemporary Education. And then he went on to say, don't worry, it's all been said before, Martin. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, at that stage, I thought I'd better read his address in detail so I didn't repeat what he'd said. Um, in that presidential, he describes his experience as a young scholar at Murdoch with a list of who's who in the Australian education research community. Many have retired and many still um, continuing to work very productively. He wonders what contributed to the success of these scholars. Whilst trying not to be too romantic, he suggested in his 2001 address, the point of my reminiscence is to suggest that what was crucial about Murdoch then was not primarily individual ability or insight conceived as personal possessions, as inherent to us as individuals, but the collective opportunities we constructed to learn from each other and to benefit from the diversity of experience and perspectives that each person brought to education issues. It was those networks and the openness of the channels of communication with our interaction that was crucial to our professional learning. Engagement, diversity and openness seem crucial to performing a productive learning community. To me, engagement, diversity and openness. Not suggesting that there's a golden past, but epitomise the kind of academic life that I think is productive 
and intellectually and emotionally rewarding. It's not something that is widespread in many of our current university contexts. In some ways, it represents a form of utopian dream for many of us. However, I do think that research associations such as AARE can help to create such learning communities, which in turn give some hope that, academic, that an academic life, like the one we often imagined, can be realised. More on that later too. Back to Peter's comment to me about it all being said before. I do hope I managed to say one or two new things. However, Peter did add that I would be able to deliver it in my unique way. I wasn't sure what that meant, but on reflection, I have think that I can begin in a way that no other president has begun the presidential, to my knowledge. And um, by way of introducing my first um, sentence, the next sentence, um, I would suggest to international colleagues and young colleagues that um, they explore some of Queensland's history in the 1970s and 80s. So here goes, delivering a presidential address. The first time I was arrested was, <laughs> I don't believe any other president has begun with that line, <laughs> was for delivering an address, ironically. It was either it was a crime or a misdemeanour in Queensland at the time. I'm not sure what my address was on, perhaps Queensland civil liberties, perhaps uranium mining, perhaps the Cold War or nuclear armed warships coming into Brisbane Harbour, perhaps land rights, perhaps ironically, it was about the right to give an address. Um, these some 35 years later, where I've swapped my milk, blue milk crate in Queen Street Mall for a lectern at the MCG Members Lounge, <laughs> I'd like to carry on, carry on in that same style as Peter suggested, and with some of the same substance, arguing for a more socially just world and one in which society's institutions, especially education, need to play a greater role in achieving that society than they do currently. In my protest days, in amongst my badges, most lost now, proclaiming amongst other things that I was an enemy of the state, I had one that was sometimes attributed to Che Guevara other times to various counterculture movements in Europe and the US. Be realistic, demand the impossible. I was reminded of this when I was reading Ruth Levitas's work on Utopia as Method, which references this call to arms. I've thus used it as my subtitle, as in a world where some of us are concerned with social justice, feel very alienated from many aspects of the societies within which we find ourselves. Demanding what we see as the impossible seems to me to be essential in this moment. And within that, so in the need, I think, of starting to think differently about schooling and education. As a consequence of trying to think differently about schooling, I've been exploring the notions of utopia, not in the ways that I once did in an anarchist bookshop in Brixton, London, when we were considering what we would do with Buckingham Palace come the revolution. <laughs> I think it's still worth considering, but, um, <laughs> but perhaps in more theoretical ways. It's interesting, I think, that utopian studies have been making a comeback if they ever went away. In the last few years, I made a decision to um, jump into the abyss of what seemed to me to be utopian studies and found, to steal from Nick Cave, that it only came up to my knees. Much of what was f I was finding and reading aligned with my own current thinking and reading. The philosopher Nancy Fraser, too, who I have worked with in my research, with colleagues such as Glenda and McGregor in alternative schooling, and also with Amanda Keddy, Peter Renshaw, and Sue Monk in our recent book, The Politics of Differentiation, has also called for an institutional imagination in the spirit of realistic utopianism. A few weeks ago, I had to say a few things, um, about four minutes about the, what I was interested at this moment in time, and I spoke about utopia um, Julie McLeod was also in that, um, at that event and afterwards she told me she too had written about utopia. I then discovered when in London quite recently when visiting the British Library that it's 500 years this year, um, it's the 500 year anniversary of Thomas More's publication of Utopia. So it seemed appropriate um, to discuss Utopia in this um, 2016 presidential address. I also noticed um, in this reading that Somerset House has hoisted a 
utopian flag um, and declared this of the year of imagination and possibility. So I think, um, I hope my um, address falls within that category. Central to my current reading has been Ruth Levitas's Utopia as Method and Eric Alwyn Wright's Realistic Utopias, both of which I will say more about through the course of this presentation. In education, concepts of utopia have been evident in the work of Fielding and Moss and Peter Moss's recent work on early childhood, David Holpin's Hope in Education, and has been, even if my co-authors might not agree or want to use the term, in some of my recent work on alternative schooling with Glenda, Kitty Tareel, Deb Hayes, and Asper Baruzis. I understand that notions of utopia can leave many cold. The very term conjures up visions of impossible realities and naive understandings of human nature. It can also be employed in the most reactionary of ways. For example, many terrorist groups have particular visions of utopia once their enemies have been destroyed. Capitalism has an underpinning utopia which constructs a world where the market dominates. Similarly, many Marxists, in my view, have a view of the ideal society where in getting there the ends justify the means, no matter how oppressive. It's then perhaps no surprise that philosophers such as Hannah Arendt have been highly suspicious of the utopia as Levitas suggests. However, I do think that utopia can be thought of differently if such visions or real utopias, as Wright argues, um, as Wright refers to them, are not regarded as blueprints that hold true in a range of locations and times, but instead, as Wright argues, can be seen as ways in which to work out the core organising principles of alternatives to existing institutions, the principles that would guide the pragmatic trial and error task of institution building. In exploring some of my concerns, I'll draw heavy, heavily on the utopian ideas, especially utopia as method, the imaginary reconstitution of society. So whilst this may seem like a um, stream of consciousness, there is an um, underlying structure to this lecture the introduction I have begun, that you're, that's done with now. Um, the utopia as method is I want to outline Ruth Levitas's work and her notions of utopia as archaeology, ontology and architecture. And then ask, what has that got to do with educational research and impact? And then to be realistic and demand the impossible and what WRE can contribute to that um, conversation. For Levitas, utopia as archaeology refers to piecing together the images of the good society that are embedded in political programs and social and economic policies. It is what many of us are very good at, critique. One only needs to look at the program at this conference to see how we critique PISA and NAPLAN, the ways in which schools perpetuate highly gendered ways of being, issues of social justice and injustice and inequities, and so on, and the consequences of such. To demonstrate this aspect of the method, she employs a sociological analysis that many are familiar with to demonstrate the taken-for-granted assumptions about the good society that underpin current policy frameworks. These include meritocracy, civil society, and economic growth. She argues, for instance, that a utopian meritocratic society underpins the various policy frameworks which advance equality of opportunity. Within the utopia of a meritocratic society, people would get their just desserts. This meritocratic utopia does not problematise capitalism. It just works out ways for it to operate more effectively by not wasting talent. This meritocratic utopia, of course, also underpins much of the current system of schooling in terms of who gets what benefits from the education process. Critiquing meritocracy within schooling has occupied vast amounts of academic work, some of my own, that has provided analyses of class, gender, race, ethnicity, and other forms of group subordination. However, it still pervades classroom talk and is present in many of the interviews that I've done with teachers and principals in schools. We also see this meritocratic utopia at play in our universities, where merit is rewarded with academic um, promotions, time away from teaching, and I think one of the great ironies in schools and faculties of education can be the desire sometimes not to teach. Um, via fellowships and the like, and it can be rewarded with administrative positions. Many of us, and I do not excuse myself from this, are often seduced by this myth of meritocracy. Another form of utopia that pervades policy, including education policy, is a society and its social organisations that be can be governed by numbers. 
And I'm not suggesting that numbers are the enemy, um, as Jenny um, alerted us to yesterday. In education, we see those numbers in testing, in determining the quality of schooling, in attempts to quantify academic work, UQ's um, Q index that gave us a number in relation to the quality of our research, which has since fortunately um, been removed. In measuring the quality of teaching in universities, for example, the UK's Teaching Excellence Framework, universities' own courses and lecture evaluations, and the quality of educational research through ERA and the soon-to-be Impact and Engagement Framework. Again, much has been written on the ways in which numbers have had, as Bob Lingard and Sam Seller indicated, perverse effects on systems of schooling. The work of Ian Hardy, Greg Thompson and Nicole Mopler also spring to mind here. The effects of these various utopias, and I sort of want to say dystopias, have included those on the ways in which teachers and students have come to see and construct themselves. This brings us to Levitas's notion of utopia as ontology. Levitas has argued any discussion of the good society must contain, at least implicitly, a claim for, for a way of being that is posited as better than our current experience. It entails both imagining ourselves otherwise and a judgment about what constitutes human flourishing. Utopia as ontology is in many ways a bridge between utopia as archaeology and architecture. Here Levitas is concerned with the ways of being human that are currently valorised and with how we might be otherwise. Within our current ways of organising schooling, we valorise those who are competitive, in particular those who can succeed within the competitive marketplace that operates in schools and universities. It's not surprising that much academic work has been done on critiquing this system and demonstrating the ways in which particular groups, for example indigenous students or students from high poverty backgrounds, become collateral damage in this system and hence provide solutions as, as to how these groups might be better served by schooling. However, I think there are dangers in focusing on improved student outcomes within much of our own work, mine included, in that we lose sight of the types of people that are being produced within this system and with what the broader purposes of schooling, maybe more accurately education, might be. My interviews with young people in alternative settings provide both an indication of how they are made to feel within current schooling structures and of how alternative structures change their sense of self. Veronica, who I'm about to introduce to you, was a year 10 high school student who was studying at an alternative education site, a farm on the outskirts of a very poor Queensland regional community. And this comes from work done with, um, with Bob, Mari Brennan, um, Peter Renshaw, Lou Zip, and Sam Sat as a cast of thousands, Richard Waters and Asper Baroutsis. Veronica told us, uh, went after she'd left her school, the reason I got kicked out is because Mr X, the deputy principal there, he actually called me a slut. When I went to tell the higher authorities, I went to the main principal. She didn't believe me. She didn't even know me. She didn't know about my history, but she would not believe me. She said that he would never say that and I swore black and blue that he did to her. I got very mad at the fact that no one believed me, so I tried to set his office on fire. <laughs> but he had a fire extinguisher in there, <laughs> as you would do, you know? Um, so it didn't get very far. And then I got in trouble by the police then and was sent out here. Here we see a young woman who was expected not to question, not to challenge authority, who has apparently been sexualized and denigrated by a senior male figure in the school, and who has reacted to what she perceives as an injustice, and in a way that demonstrates the level of outrage she feels. However, schools, when they are constructed differently, when they reject deficit constructions of young people in their communities, when they are concerned with all of their students, when they know all of the students, when they are interested in working with young people to make their school lives a positive experience, then it can impact on how these young people come to see themselves and their um, place in the world far more positively. They can also work to change how teachers see themselves. In an English alternative school that Glenda and I visited, we spoke to a teacher and, and we have spoke to many different teachers who talk about why they have left the mainstream system. In this case, this teacher told us, I taught for a year in a traditional school. 
but I just found it very difficult being in constant opposition to the kids. I didn't want to be in constant opposition. I wanted to work with them. We were told, don't smile until Christmas. Remember, their year starts in September. You know, if you, sh you know, I think I've heard that um, in our schools, of you don't smile till Easter. You know, if you show a sign of weakness, they will defeat you. And that's the way the system is, and that's the way it works. And it was everything that I was opposed to, and I didn't like, and I couldn't do it. This teacher left the school after finding he was starting to shout at kids and didn't like who he had become. However, it's not only young people and teachers who can be changed by new structures, by new forms of social organisation, by new forms of pedagogical relationships. In another alternative school setting that I've visited many times with Glenda and have become quite fond of, and which is located in the centre of a regional town in Queensland and has the support of a local high school there, the local council, Rotary and the like. It's got a community outreach program that sets up situations whereby elder members of the community come and hold regular one-on-one -on -one conversations with students about the meaning of life or whatever else might crop up. These can be life-changing for both the students and for the elder people. A conversation we had with a retired magistrate was instructive here. He told us, I walked up the front stairs and I saw, in those days, there was a couple of boys that were in raggedy clothes, dirty, smelly hair. One of them had bits of steel, metal, hanging all out of his face. I was thinking to myself, why the hell, what am I doing here? It's only a couple of years ago I was sentencing kids like that. And then I come in and it took a session, probably an hour of talking to these kids. And then I started to realise, hey, wait a minute, I have prejudged these kids. I'd been prejudging them wrongly, of course, prejudging here powerful significance that this was a magistrate. So now I've totally changed the way I think, as I tell the people when they ask me to talk at various places, and he goes around to Rotary and various organisations such as that to talk about his experience as being a magistrate now working with young people. I tell people at various places, it's really education, not legislation, that will fix the problem of youth. I don't mean formal education. I mean education in all sorts of things. Education in all sorts of things. I agree. Here we come, perhaps, to a conversation about the purposes of education. Excuse me. There are aspects of the world that make me think we need to change who we are and that we need to think about different ways of being. These include, but are clearly not limited, to the following issues. Racism. Gendered violence. Politics of hate. And environmental vandalism. Australian Human Rights Commission President Gillian Triggs in the Derek Fielding Memorial Lecture at Brisbane Supreme Court was reported as saying on the ABC 2016 website that human rights concerns in Australia had reached unprecedented levels in the past few years. She went on to state that Australia has become, in my view, isolated and exceptional in its approach to the protection of human rights, that Australians should be alert and alarmed about the erosion of their rights, that it was a sad state of affairs given Australia was historically a global champion of human rights. She marked 2001 as a turning point. Then something went terribly wrong with the start of the new millennium. Australia faltered. We've been in retreat. I'd like to think that schools and educational research can play a role in limiting that retreat and perhaps turning the tide completely. However, I think our obsession with um, with understanding and problematising outcomes and measurement, PISA and NAPLAN and the like, has to come at the expense of a recognition that education and educational research can and should attempt to improve the society, the various communities, global and local, of which we are part. So providing critique without positing alternatives is problematic. I've always liked the letter that Lisa Delpit provides a copy of in her book, Other People's Children, a letter which a principal provides to new staff on their first day at the school. The letter says, Dear teacher, 
I am the survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no person should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers. Children poisoned by educated physicians. Infants killed by trained nurses. Women and babies shot and burned by high school and college graduates. So I'm suspicious of education. My request is, help your students become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated Eichmanns. Writing and arithmetic are important only if they were to make our children more humane. As Delbert has argued, having good engineers and doctors is important. But this is not enough, not nearly enough. I think it's necessary for us to think about new ways of doing schooling and education. However, I worry that the message in this letter is one that is sometimes trivialised by many in the policy arena, but certainly not all. And that the concerns of the marginalised and the oppressed, as in this Holocaust survivor, are not being addressed in Australia. I think we've become a nation, and we're clearly not alone, that's lost its heart, its compassion. Many Indigenous people would of course argue with, with justification that Australia as a, as a nation has never had a heart. Australia again is not alone here. Many nations are also shaped by the same oppressive, racist, protectionist, misogynist and homophobic discourses as our own societies. However, in my view, so bad is the state of the world and of education systems that contribute to these harms that as Michael Fielding has suggested, we have no alternative but to look for alternatives. Thus, we come to notions of utopia as architecture. Levitas has argued that imagining alternatives helps to counter conformity by contradicting the taken for granted character of the real. However, this is not always easy to do. When I was on study leave at um, Roehampton, Becky, and I, Becky Francis and I both expressed concerns about the ways in which many of us, and ourselves included, had become very adept at critique, but were less adept at providing some visions of what needed to be done to create a more socially just education system. We edited a special issue of the Journal of Education Policy on the topic, what would a socially just education system look like? A number of very high profile international academics had great difficulty imagining such a scenario, indeed did not make it into the issue because they argued the situ situation was so bad that it was very difficult to envisage a positive future for education. I understand that position, However, for, for me, it's difficult to forget the words of the infamous um, British Prime Minister who declared, there is no alternative, which came to be known by its acronym, TINA. In this case, she was referring to global capitalism, to neoliberal ideologies, most especially market competition, and to the erosion of society and the valorization of the individual. I want to resist what Fielding and Moss refer to as the dictatorship of no alternative, or tyranny, which seems a little less structural to me, this tyranny of no alternative. I want to be able to imagine new alternatives, new ways of thinking and acting, new ways of living, and new ways of educating young people. And this is what brings me to utopia as architecture, and the rejection of Tina. I'll take her off for a bit. Um, I've, um, I've seen schools that I've written about with Glenda in our 2014 book, that provide opportunities to consider how schools could be otherwise than they are. For example, where students of all ages and staff make all, and I mean all, decisions at a school meeting. These have included the employment of teachers, disciplinary actions, teacher salaries, curriculum choices, school rules, and so on. As a student at this rural English school told us, in their pride in differentiating themselves as much more radical than Summerhill, told us, Basic the school meeting has the final definitive say on anything in the school that goes on. Expulsions, monetary matters, anything at all can be brought up in the school meeting and overruled by everyone, the student body, the teacher body, all together, one vote, exactly the same. That's not a veto by a head teacher or anything. No, because at Summerhill they have a veto, which we don't have, implying they were much more radical. I've also seen students, schools take those students that no other school has wanted or have ensured that students who in the past faced massive barriers to attending school are able to actually attend. Some of these schools have no suspension or exclusion policies, beginning every day as a new day. They've set in motion a range of support structures 
that meet, for example, students' legal, housing and emotional needs through, for example, creches, transport to and from school, attending Centrelink or court with students. I'm aware of the critiques of some of these schools. In the first instance, it can be argued they are small, true. In the case of the democratic schools, that they're exclusionary because they cater to middle class students and that the young people who come to them have been brought up by parents who are committed to ideals of democratic parenting and so on. In most cases, true. In relation to the second set of schools, they can be accused of providing a way in which mainstream schools, for want of a better term, can remove those students who are perceived as being damaging to the school's reputation or good order. True. However, in both types of school, there are some, in my view, that do offer a new way of engaging those who have been disenfranchised by the system. As such, and as Michael Fielding is noting, they offer up new ways of being. As he states, when we actually encounter radical alternatives, it is in large part their brute reality, their enacted denial of injustice and inhumanity, and their capacity to live out a more fulfilling, more generous view of human flourishing that in turn moves us to think and act differently. So what does this have to do with educational research? Sorry, it gets very hot under the slide. I want to try and apply some of the Utopia's method tools to a consideration of educational research and impact and engagement. To consider how, an educational, how educational research can engage in Levitas's imaginary reconstitution of society. So to archaeology. In terms of Utopia's archaeology, we need, I think, to look at academic life today and how the utopias implicit within the dominant discourses shaping our worlds inhibit or enhance our engagement with that task. There is much to be concerned with in relation to various practices within the higher education sector. For example, without putting too fine a point on it, the austerity measures that exist in our places of work that continue to make us try and do more with less. As educational researchers, we are concerned about the ways in which our research is often denigrated as second class by media commentators, there's no need to mention names here, and sometimes by some of our own. We're concerned when educational research is farmed out to accounting firms and think tanks. Again, no need to mention names here, but I would draw your attention to a special issue of AER on think tanks. There are concerns with the ways in which the audit culture is shaping our everyday work as everything is measured and counted, or in some cases, not counted. This has been clearly the case with ERA and the soon to be impact and engagement agenda, which I think we do need to critique where appropriate, but also recognise may have some positive um, implications for us. But whilst I don't think we should shy away from wanting to have an impact or to engaging with the communities with which we undertake our research or with each other nationally and internationally, the problem lies or will lie in how impact and engagement will be measured and determined and how that affects how we come to see ourselves as researchers. So in relation to ontology, the ways in which the ideal self is demonstrated in the current environment is best, best perhaps described as terrified, as Ball does in relation to those working in English schools, the terrors of performativity. Academics are terrified of being seen as irrelevant, as not performing by way of publications and grant income, or for some of us, becoming so terrified of becoming something we do not want to be by becoming highly competitive through engaging in comparisons with our colleagues I've seen, and competition with our colleagues. I've seen some promotion applications where candidates have done metric searches on other staff members or academics in other universities in order to justify their promotions. It's also been said to me, and I don't know if it's true or not, in relation to ARC assessments, you're tough on each other. Is this part of the competitive regime we have taken up? The it only matters if it's measured discourse impacts about how we go about our daily work lives. It can affect willingness to support colleagues to engage in external work. When our, we look at our, for instance, our workload formulas, rarely do they cover external service. And anybody who has, a, has been a journal editor knows how hard it is to find reviewers. And I think the ways in which those, that work is never measured also has an impact. It can cause us to become something other than we want to be, this focus on competition. For example, when we engage in sneaky looks at other colleagues' Google Scholar citations. And admit it, 
you have done it too. <laughs> perhaps, however, perhaps, the new engagement agenda, which hopefully will reward collaborations, can be used to help us to become something else. Which brings me to architecture. Throughout the course of this presidency, and a result of becoming a new head of school, I've been thinking about the idea of what kind of school of education would I like to work in. Indeed, as we go through some difficult times at my own workplace, this is the question I've been posing to all staff, both professional and academic. What kind of school do we want this to be? What kind of educational research community do we want this to be? I think if we as researchers were to consider what the ideal, the utopian vision would be for the education academic community, I'm sure that impact would figure. Whilst not wanting to seem completely utilitarian and recognising that, as Jeff Whitty has done, educational research is worthy of studying in its own right, we as educational researchers do want to make a difference to the educational experiences of children, young people and adults, and specific populations within those groups. We want to see teachers be provided with workplaces that support their well-being and their pedagogical activities. We want to see universities that care about their employees and the work undertaken by those employees, and so on. However, as Furlong has indicated, the apparent lack of impact, and I'd say apparent, I would argue, he, um, Furlong argues, is a major flaw in the defence of the discipline, a flaw that urgently needs to be addressed. So I think we do need, need to make our work more visible and more influential, and maybe the impact um, and engagement agenda can help us there. However, and, in, and as I indicated above, and as Francis has stated, whilst impact is important, there is a moral imperative for academics to engage the impact agenda beyond the narrow drivers of research assessment measures, measurements. Referring to Sarah Delamont's work, she argues for academics to focus on what we consider to be our own impact priorities. Along such lines, John Furlong has stated, if education as a field of study is to be fully integrated into the university system, like the university system as a whole, it urgently needs to find a voice. It needs to set out, I inserted utopian in there, I hope he doesn't mind. Um, it needs to set out a utopian vision for itself. It needs to state what its purpose or purposes should be in the modern world. I don't want to make this last part of my, talk, my lecture as an advertisement for AARE. But I do think that educational research organisations like AARE, BIRA, AERA, NZARE, WIRA, ATIA and so on can be central to creating that vision by demonstrating alternative ways of being. And as such, I want to highlight some of those aspects of what it suggests, what I think AARE suggests are utopian possibilities. Keeping in mind Levitas's view that all utopias are flawed. AARE is our community. It's not the executive, any particular office bearer, or the conference, but us, the people in this room, and some who couldn't be with us. We can make it what we want it to be. AARE can be our realistic utopian space where academics work on common purposes, where there is a counterpoint to current trends in universities, what Kathleen Lynch and her colleagues have referred to as the careless university. The conference, I think, the, f in the field of educational research has to engage with the big questions of what kind of society do we want to live in and how can our research to contribute to such a vision. I think the vast majority of research projects at this conference have much to contribute to such a debate. I think we should embrace the notion of making sure that those projects have an impact and that we as a community work to support each other in that endeavour. As an organisation, we've been working closely with senior policy officers, many of whom are in this room, and are also members of AARE, to ensure that policy and research is not seen as distant cousins, to develop ways in which we might come to and understand each other's priorities better so that we can benefit the lives of the young people in our schools. As an organisation, we've been engaging beyond our borders. We've been trying to internationalise our engagement with like-minded organisations. We have members of other, many other national associations attending this conference. And I'd like to extend a warm and belated welcome to Professor Gary McCulloch, um, the incoming president of BIRA to the conference. We support a symposium at AERA, NZARE and BIRA so that our, re our researchers can attend those conferences. We're also now providing support through APIRA, the Asia Pacific Education Research Association, 
to an Asian educational research association from a low-income Asian country to bring a symposium to upcoming AARE conferences. We've lobbied on behalf of us all in relation to the ARC's impact and engagement agenda. We're currently in the process of putting a statement together drawn from the work of educational professors from across the country, outlining our concerns and making suggestions for further refinements of the assessment ex exercise. We're clo working closely with ATIA, the um, Australian Teacher Education Association, and the Australian Council of Deans of Education to work on understanding the importance of research within the teaching profession. I think uh, in Raymond Williams' terms, we want to not just be an alternative, but to be oppositional, to provide a resistance to what we see as current oppressive um, work. WRE's theory workshops seek to provide what for many academics has become a luxury, time to read, to think and engage in deep conversations over a lengthy period of time. I was recently talking with a former early career colleague who'd worked at a university where someone had made a sarcastic comment to him because he was reading a book in his office as if he had time for such an indulgence. The ever-demanding nature of our work does mean that stopping to read can be pushed aside. Engaging with discussions about theory and methodology can be extremely difficult. I would guess that the vast majority of my colleagues, and I know, I know that many at work do, my workplace do, eat at their desks or computers at lunchtime. WRE workshops then, I think, make sure, which we make sure are distributed around the country, often in regional areas, provide a space for one of the reasons why many of us came to, into academia, to engage in intellectual discussion can take place. What is more, the presenters and those organising these workshops give up their time with no rewards and certainly no workload points from their home institutions to support this, this endeavour. I would also acknowledge the deans and heads of school across the country, though, who have supported these workshops through the provision of space, catering and the like. We have a set of strategic initiatives because we recognise that funding for important events and projects dear to the hearts of our members can be difficult to come by. We have a programme of strategic initiatives that enable our members, and each must contain an early career researcher, to help set educational agendas across the country. We seek to foreground new and exciting and groundbreaking work through our awards, and many people again give their time and willingly to be on committees like the Doctoral Award Committee to support the selection of these awards. I looked um, before I started for a colleague, um, Remy Lowe from University of Sydney, who yesterday he and I were walking, were being shown by a, and I won't mention the girl's name because I couldn't get permission to use her name. Probably she was about 10 and she was showing us how to, where to go to find the room to load up our presentations. And on the way, she told us she'd been at her mother's presentation and, that, and she had a lanyard on and described to us how that during the course of that presentation and in between various sessions, she had stand up, stood up and given a presentation to the audience. And in the process of talking, she said, and I said to them, um, down with the oppressors. And, <laughs> and there was at some point then when I thought, this is my conference. This is where I want to be. <laughs> and there is, whilst I tried to think about how I could build that in to this, and I put, saw nowhere else but to put it in at this slot, I do want to say that there is something that captures that moment for me about what I think we can become. So in conclusion, so realistic utopian spaces, as indicated by Wright, are not finished projects. They are projects underway. It's with this recognition that I do want to say something about Indigenous engagement. WRE has many Indigenous colleagues amongst our membership and very senior people such as Tracy Bunder and slightly younger colleagues such as Melita Hogarth, both of whom until the AGM tonight are on the executive, although when I was writing this I didn't know that Tracy would not be at the executive, are integral to our organisation. As an executive we've been pursuing an agenda that has tried to make the educational research community an inclusive one. You'll have noticed that we have an indigenous, indigenous interpretive tour at this conference, and if you were in Fremantle, you would have seen the tour to Rottnest Island. We want to ensure that opportunities are provided at each conference site to learn about the culture and histories of the land in which we are meeting. We have designated two pos positions on the executive for Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander researchers. These positions are determined by the indigenous academics in our community. 
We are currently working on an apology to Indigenous communities on the part of the educational research community. When Jill Blackmore and I were discussing with Tracy AARE's response to the ARC's impact engagement and impact agenda, she spoke of time. I asked what she would say about a new early career researcher who indicated that they would be prepared to listen to community needs, would share their ideas and consult at all stages of the research and dissemination phases. After some quiet moment, she indicated that that person would show potential. Only time will tell. I hope that our association is one that is showing potential and as such can help other institutions to develop potential. I know for me the lessons I've learned about Indigenous education and research from working in WARE are helping me to think about my own institution's practices and policies. We know we need to do more in matters of social justice and I know Annette, the incoming president and the executive and the vast majority of the association's members are highly committed to doing so. In relation to refugees, to the hate and discrimination that's been picking up pace in many countries in Western Europe, the US and Australia. To consider the needs of our staff members of, of, the, of our association who do not have tenure and go from short term contract to contract. I would like us as an education research community, for instance, to take up Jeff Duncan Andrade's call for education not just to help and escape from poverty, but to end it. Engaging in such utopian tasks will not be easy. As Graham Smith, the highly respected Maori academic, and I'm thankful to a group of Maori students at NZARE for drawing me to this quote. So Graham Smith, respected Maori academic, when discussing critical kapu Maori theory, stated, to paraphrase, don't just write about it, don't just talk about it, to quote, show me the blisters on your hands. This represents to me a call to have impact. It's a recognition that talking and writing about education policy, theory, pedagogy, curriculum, and most important social ju importantly, social justice is not enough. We have to be concerned with impact, with engagement, with action, with making a difference, with demonstrating the blisters on our hands. At times, this might seem overwhelming, but in these uncertain and confronting times, I think we need to remain realistic and to demand the impossible. Thank you.